Well, again, my name is Mark Benedum, and um, I am privileged to be able to come and share with you this morning, uh, whether you're in the building or you're online. Uh, you know that there's that insurance commercial on TV that warns you about becoming your parent? Well, I'm the guy they're warning you about, so... Uh, the, the technology piece of it, you online, you know, are, uh, um, we're so glad you're here, but if I forget you're there, it's not because I don't care, it's just I'm, I'm that guy. So anyway, uh, we are, hopefully, uh, Andrew is going to be um, enjoying a well-deserved vacation uh, for the next couple of weeks, he and family up in Canada, and so continue to pray for him and uh, pray for Pastor Paul, who is carrying the, uh, or you know, defending the fort while he's gone. My experience in life, uh, and I've started to uh, acquire some because I just had a birthday this week, uh, adding another another year. I won't say how many, but uh, adding another year. And uh, my experience is that Americans, we have a love-hate relationship with money. We love to have it, and we hate it when we don't. (laughs) Right? Because money is more than just a means of commercial transaction, isn't it? Money represents things, and it causes us to feel things. It represents power and control, and it gives us a sense, and I want to underline sense, a sense of security. And so it's really one of those things in life that we all have to deal with. And if we're honest, I'd rather have money than not have money. Money is a very spiritual matter. Did you know that? It's a very spiritual matter. Did you know that there are somewhere between 800 and 1,000 verses in the Bible on money? That's more than hell. That's more than prayer. That's more than faith. Money matters. It's one of those things that we, we have to deal with it. There's a reason they call it the almighty dollar. Because it can easily become an idol in our life. It can be, and an idol is simply anything that comes between you and God. Or takes God's place in your life. And so money is one of those things we don't like to talk a lot about. But we need to talk about it from time to time. And uh, I felt like, you know, I'm not relying on this congregation for my salary, so I can talk about money. (laughs) Now, the Apostle Paul warns us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, that uh, loving money is a dangerous affection. Let's read that text together here. This is a supporting text. But he says, But for those of you who desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving, this craving, that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. My guess is that you may know somebody who's had that experience. Money is a dangerous affection. And yet, we still need it. Remember in It's a Wonderful Life when Clarence comes to save George and he asked him, you know, George is in trouble, and he, and he asked him, he says, you got any money? And Clarence looks at him and he says, I, well, I don't have money where I come from. And George says, well, at 
kind of helps down here, bub. <laughs> That's kind of where we are. Living in this place between how do I realize the importance of money and, as a resource and yet not getting sucked in to craving it and desiring it and making it the focus of, of what I live for. In Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at that passage. If you have a, a, a Bible, I encourage you to open it and write notes in it. Um, even if it's your wife's or your husband's, write the notes in it. And, or if you have an electronic one, that's fine too. But I want you to follow along. It's in the middle of a sermon. I'm going to preach a sermon on a sermon. But the sermon I'm preaching on is perhaps the greatest sermon ever preached. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew 5 through 7. And right in the middle of it, Jesus has this section that we're going to be looking at this morning. We often think of the Sermon on the Mount as sort of this idealistic view of life, but it's really not. It's really a very practical text. You see, Jesus is talking to people who are citizens of heaven, but they're still living on earth. That's us. We are citizens of heaven, and yet we are still living in this world. How do we navigate this issue of being able to see money as a resource, but not as a craving or an addiction or something that causes me such stress that I, you know, it, it, it stresses me out? He begins chapter 6 talking about very practical things. He talks in, in, in the first couple verses about giving and how we ought to give. And then in verses 5 to 15, he talks about how to pray. And in fact, we pray it every week. It's called the Lord's Prayer, but it really is kind of the disciples' prayer. And it is in the disciples' prayer, he teaches us how to pray. This is how you ought to pray. And then he talks about religious uh, uh, duties that we have, and then he comes right up to money. How do we deal with money? This morning, I want to look at three principles for a healthy relationship with your money. Regardless of how much you have or don't have, three principles from Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be reading from verses 19 to 24. Here's my idea this morning. If you want to put it up on the screen. Uh, back one to the, to the idea there, Rick. And basically the idea is that financial freedom has less to do with your net worth than your heart's affections. Financial freedom has less to do with your net worth than our heart's affections. And Matthew explains why. Let's read verses 19 to 24. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will devote be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Notice it doesn't say you cannot have God and money. It says you cannot serve God and money. The first of the three principles that I'm going to talk about this morning comes from verses... 19 to 21, and it is simply this. Don't hoard what you won't use. Don't hoard what you won't use. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures. 
Now, people have, have looked at that, and they've used this verse as an excuse. It says, you know what? Don't save money. You shouldn't save money. You shouldn't have a retirement plan. You shouldn't do this, or you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't seek to make good investments. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. But you know what? That view is naive, and you know it. And it's superficial. If we, if, if money and possession are acquired honestly, with integrity, they can be used as great blessings. They can be a blessing in your life, for your family, for your children, your grandchildren. They can be tools for your use. Because the reality is, is how do I give if I don't have something to give, right? I have to, I have to be able to, to give in order, or have in order to give. The very commandments against coveting and stealing assume that people have things that can be coveted and stolen. Now, coveting is a word that we don't use too often. I haven't used it probably in anywhere but a sermon in, in probably 20 years. But coveting is simply a desire to have what somebody else has that I do not. I can covet their house, their car. I mean, people covet people's spouses. We covet all kinds of things. We are not to covet that which we don't have that somebody else has. Or stealing, which is more obvious, that's just simply taking what's not ours. And so those com commandments assume that material possessions are a part of life and that we have them. In fact, we are commanded to do some things that would lead us to that. In 2 Thessalonians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, it says, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Paul, that's kind of harsh. <laughs> For we hear that some of you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but are busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and earn their own living. Work is not a curse. Work is a blessing. Okay? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Let me just put that one up there. Here for the third time, he writes to the Corinthians, I am ready to come to you and I will not be a burden for I seek not what is yours but you. You know, that's how God feels about you. He doesn't, he doesn't need your money. Even though we're supposed to give, what he wants is our heart. What he wants is us. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So there's a command that says we are to save with a purpose in mind to bless our children and our grandchildren, I believe, and on and down. Romans chapter 13, verses 7 and 8. Let me just pay to all who what is owed them, to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Again, if I, have, if I am to pay something that I owe, that implies that I have something that I've paid, paid for or am paying for. And uh, the idea of getting out of debt that is often derived from this is a good principle. A good principle. Because otherwise we are bound. So we must have money in order to pay for things that we owe. So what is it? that Jesus is talking about here when he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. Well, there's two terms here that I think we need to understand. The first is treasure, okay? Let's look at that word for a second. 
Now, there are a lot of words for money in the Bible. Oftentimes, money is referred to as silver. And in verse 24, there's a, it says you cannot serve God and money. That word is mammon. You can't serve God and mammon. And that in, implies material wealth or material possessions. But this word treasure is a different word. Because it, it carries with it not just sort of an objective, you know, black and white sort of understanding of the term money, but treasure carries with it an emotional component. We speak about somebody treasuring their spouse. I hope that we treasure our pastor and pastors because Andrew's a treasure. I've been, I've been in enough churches that you need to understand this man is a treasure, okay? He is a gift to this church. There's an emotional component to it. You know, you think of a chest with, filled with doubloons and, and jewels and things. There's an emotional part of that that, we, that is incorporated. He says, do not lay up for yourselves stuff that when it gets its hooks into you, you you're emotionally wrapped up in it. A treasure is something precious. Remember this guy? Gollum. Gollum. His name just kind of says it all. Gollum was a hobbit in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, wasn't he? You're probably familiar with the story. But he came into contact with the ring of power that gave him something that he couldn't, you know, it gave him this unbelievable power that he could disappear. But what happened was, what? When he put this ring on, it began to affect his soul. It began to shrivel him. And what started out looking like me, ended up looking like this. His soul was shriveled because he loved this ring. He called it my precious. I love my precious. And he would do almost anything to keep it. It was his treasure. And we saw what that did to his soul. Men and women, anything we can't let go of is in danger of becoming a treasure on earth. Anything we can't let go of can become an idol. It is something, a treasure is something that we emotionally Consider precious and valuable. Now, he says, he talks about the treasure on earth, but he also says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What, what does treasure in heaven look like? Think about that. Have you ever thought, what, is, what does treasure in heaven look like? Here's a, here's a hint. What does God think is precious? Love. What's precious to God is that we would love God and that we would love other people. And when we do that, we experience treasure in heaven. And the real treasure is God himself. It is intimacy with the living God. To know him is better than life. That's the treasure that, that he wants us to, to pursue. And the stuff in our life can sometimes get in the way, okay? So it is, it is a treasure. It is, it is something emotionally precious to us. But he also says, lay up for yourselves this treasure. Lay up for yourself. It's, it's this. It's, it's no longer a resource, but it is a source of personal meaning and identity. When your and my stuff becomes a source of meaning and purpose in my life, I'm in danger. I'm in danger with what Paul talks about in 1 Timothy. If I can't let go of it,
it's in danger of becoming an idol. Now, if, 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 I, I don't, if, if I look at it that way, I don't own it, it begins to own me, and it begins to shrivel my soul. And what happens when I, I store up for this, these things in my, you know, in my life, I want more. And because you, anything in this world will eventually sort of run out of glitter, and it will, you'll, you'll want more. And what do you end up doing? We hoard. The principle is don't hoard what you don't or won't use. And it can be, you know, m- most anything. I had a water ski when I was in college. When I went off to sem- uh, se- uh, <laughs> seminary, not cemetery, seminary, <laughs> um, I, had, I had two possessions in my I had a, a stereo, you know, big speakers. That was what it was back in the 70s. Remember that? Some of you do. And a beautiful Connolly water ski. It was inlaid with wood, mahogany. It was beautiful. I think I skied on it after I went off to seminary maybe three or four times. I don't even know where it is today. It doesn't matter. But what, what the, the issue is something that gets this emotional hook on you. Maybe it's fear. We tend to hoard. <laughs> who, who ever thought this would be the ring of power? Right? My precious. <laughs> I've seen people walk out of Costco with enough of this stuff to last a thousand years. <laughs> Don't hoard what you won't use. Don't hoard what you won't use and you'll have peace because you'll be free then to give stuff away. When we hoard wealth or we spend it so lavishly on ourselves, we... We don't, aren't able to give the way God would want us to give because it is in giving that we find life. Now, when does saving cross over into hoarding? When does saving cross over into hoarding? I can't answer that one for you. But I do have a rule of thumb, a couple of them actually. First of all, does what you're saving have a purpose that you're going to use it for? (laughs) That will honor God. (laughs) That's a pretty good caveat, you know. Does it have a purpose? Or is it out of fear that I'm acquiring? Here's my three-year, here's my rule of thumb. If you haven't used it in three years, you're probably not going to use it. Give it away or sell it, even better. You know, a couple months ago, we had a garage sale here at the church. And did you know God did a miracle that day? He turned a room full of junk into (laughs) $7,000 for his purpose and his glory. If you haven't used it for three years, Get it out the door. We moved to Phoenix from Casper, Wyoming. What are winters like in Casper, Wyoming? Kind of like Wenatchee, right? We moved to Phoenix. The first, su- the, the, the first summer we were there, it hit 115. And I went out into the garage and I look, and here was a snow shovel in my garage. <laughs> I had... You know, I finally gave it to somebody that had a place up in Flagstaff because I knew they would use it. If you haven't used it, get rid of it. That's what garage sales are for. Really, I think. Anyway, don't hoard what you won't use, okay? Principle number one. Principle number two. Don't covet what blinds you to your need for God. Don't covet what blinds you for your need for God. For God. You see, we come to the second section of this passage, 
and he said, all of a sudden he's talking about the I. What's the I got to do with anything? That, see, all I know is it's all related to money. Starts talking about money, talks about the I, and then he finishes talking about money. The whole section is about money. So whatever the I is talking about, it's about money. And here's what I think it means. When he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. The ancients thought that, you know, you could look into people's eyes, and, and they do. You can read kind of what's going on, maybe not as well as you think you can. But it, the idea was that it was the, how we looked at things affected what was going on inside of us. Men and women, greed and covetousness are diseases of the eye. Things have value because of what we see in them, what we place in them. They, they, this is valuable, why? You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> but it, what I'm, I'm getting at is that it, it's it, what we, we invest value into things, some people more than others, on the exact same thing. They're diseases of the eye. We want what others have, and then when we want something that, we, um, that is shinier when it comes along. Because ultimately, everything in this world, everything in this world eventually starts to lose its shine a little bit. And we want something new. We want a new model. We want a, you know, some other thing to, to fulfill us. And nothing in this world can fulfill us, ultimately except knowing Christ. Part of the psychology of retail is you keep putting things in front of people, shinier things, and they go, oh, I like that. Yeah, but this has this and this and this. Oh, I like that even better. Yeah, but, and it's on sale. Honey, we're going to save so much money because we bought it on sale, but we don't need it. Saving money all the way. Here's an, a little daily exercise that I, I challenge you to do. Next time you're offered a, a deal or something more or a, a second helping at the restaurant that you can go to now, just simply say, thanks, I have enough. Thank you, I have enough. I really don't need anything more. I'm fine. Do that once a day. Just do that once a day. Thank you. I have enough. You'll be amazed what it does to your waistline. What it does to your, your heart and your spirit. Jesus is saying that if we have a healthy view of stuff, we won't get blinded by greed. And greed is darkness. Greed blinds us. It, it, it hinders, it obscures, it desensitizes our true need. We think because we have money that we don't need God. You know, in, back in, the, in uh, England, in John, when John Wesley was beginning the Methodist movement, he went to the poorest of the poor in London and, and in, in various parts of the country, and he began his movement, and he had unbelievable success. People were coming to faith in Christ left and right, and and what he discovered, though, is that over time, they began to put into principles these practices of, of using their money wisely and not getting drunk and not beating their wives and, you know, kicking the dog and all these things. And what he discovered was they started to, to climb the socioeconomic ladder. And you know what happened when they did that? They stopped coming. Because they thought they don't need it anymore. If you think that was true in England, what do you think is true in America today? We are the wealthiest country ever existed. <laughs> the greatest danger to our country is the thought that we don't need God anymore. The greatest danger to your spiritual life is that we, I don't need God because I got enough money saved up. Greed darkens the soul. It obscures our need for God. Remember the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter uh, 19? I don't have this on there, but I'll, this, you know the story. Rich, rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He says, you know, Lord, what must I do to attain eternal life? And Jesus, you know, as he would any rabbi and teaching the, the Jewish person come to him and say, keep the commandments, do this and observe all these things and you will have, you know, you will... 
be in a good, good place. And, he, and, and the rich young ruler checks him off. Yep, did that, did that, did that, yep, did that. What, must, what else must I do? Jesus looks at him. He says, then give away all you own, and you will have treasure in heaven. And you know what happens. Oh. And he walked away. Because he had all these possessions. And in that passage, Jesus says, this is the way it is. He says, this is why it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Because it obscures our soul. Don't covet what blinds you, your need for God. Lord, I would really, I would honor you with my life if I win the lottery. God's not going to let you win the lottery for heaven's sake. Why? Because it's going to blind your knee. You're going to really think that you're set. And yet we, we pursue that. Remember this, the story in Luke chapter 12. The guy, tells, Jesus tells a parable. Uh, individual that comes to me, he says, a land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. What a problem. You could give some away. What shall I do with my crops? He said, I, I will do this. I will tear down my barns. And I will build a four-story condominium. And I will say to my soul, soul, talking in the third person to himself, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, where will they be? So the one who lays up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. Men and women, the answer to your stuff is not having more stuff. The answer to your stuff is does your stuff own you? Reminds me, the rich young fool reminds me of uh, this guy. Again, I'll tear it down, I'll build more. I'll have everything I need. I've got more than I need. You know, it would have been wonderful if he just said, you know what, thank you. I have enough. Thank you. I have enough. John D. Rockefeller, wealthiest man of the 19th century, was asked by a reporter one time, you're the richest man in the world. I mean, he's the equivalent of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, all of them today. Founder of Standard Oil, he says, well, how much is enough? And you know what his answer was? Just a little bit more. A little bit more. And men and women, John D. Rockefeller was a Christian. He was a born-again, believing man who put his faith in Jesus. And we're going to see him one day. So this isn't just for those bad folks out there. This is for us to realize we got to get our eyes on the prize, the real prize. Because if we don't, if we, you know, don't hoard what you won't use. Don't covet what blinds you to your need for God. Because if you, if you hoard and you covet, if you're looking for fulfillment, you won't find it there. You won't find liberation there. In fact, what you will find is enslavement. Look at verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate one, love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Ultimately, you are going to serve something or someone. You're going to serve someone. If it's your money, good luck. Greed doesn't make you a king. Greed makes you a slave. Doesn't matter how much money you have. Doesn't, it, greed is not a function of how much money you have. Greed is an attitude of the heart. It, you give power to that thing that controls your plans. It dictates your drives. It dictates your desires. 
Imagine pursuing God with the intensity that we pursue the almighty dollar. James Hewitt is a writer some years ago, and he said, a budget is a theological statement. It tells you what you worship, what or who you worship. So does your checkbook register. It tells you what you worship. It tells you what's precious to you. Serving money doesn't just squeeze God out. It causes me to resent the fact that he demands that it's his in the first place. Don't serve a master that can't love you. That isn't capable of loving you the way you need to be loved. Because ultimately if I serve money in my life, I will ultimately love money and use people instead of loving people and using money. Loving money, I will try to use God for my purposes. Try to convince him that my idea is right. I will love money and use God. And that's really what Timothy's talking about, or Paul's writing in Timothy back in 1 Corinthians 6. That's what it brings us back to. Those who have a passion for this are going to end up in a place of pain and destruction. You covet, so you hoard. You hoard, so you get enslaved. And once, once you're enslaved for a length of time, you will give up faith. That's the pangs. So where's your treasure? Where's my treasure? I have, you know, one thing about preaching this stuff, you've got to challenge yourself. Where's my treasure? What do I do? What do I do with this? How do, I, how do I not hoard? How do I not covet? How do I not serve the wrong master? Well, let me just close with four next steps. Okay? Four things that you can do when you leave here today, and you can say, okay, I'm going to begin to try to put this into practice. Okay? Number one, I will acknowledge daily that everything I own is God's. Rule number one. Everything I own is God's. You know, we just had a bunch of friends come and help us move here a couple weeks ago, and I looked around at all the stuff that got moved, and I said, man, God has a lot of stuff. (laughs) And he can't even sit in that sofa. I will acknowledge every day that what I own is God's. It's not mine. I am a steward. I am the one. He's entrusted to care for this stuff. I will acknowledge daily everything I own is God. Number two, I will choose to be grateful for whatever I have and not covet what I don't. The greatest defense against greed is gratitude. Be grateful for what you have. And you will not be tempted to look for something more. Ironic thing is, is when I'm grateful for what I have, God tends to give us more. But he gives it in the right way and the right thing. I will choose to be grateful. That's a choice for whatever I have. I will not covet what I don't. Number three, I will see money as a resource to live, not a reason to live. It is a resource for living, not a reason for living. Finally, I will serve the master, not MasterCard. Some of the stress that some of us are feeling is because we're in debt, and I get it. You're being told every day, thousands of times, buy this, buy that, five, you know, five easy payments for this, you know, low interest rate. And debt is not sin, but it is enslavement. The borrower is slave to the lender. You owe somebody. And if you can get out of debt, the faster you can, I think the better. Take a, take a Dave Ramsey course. Do, do something that, that, you know, 
maybe you're driving a car that you can't afford to drive. Sell it. Get a car you can't afford. Maybe you, you've bought a house you can't afford. Now's a good time to sell a house, believe me. Better find, have another one lined up before you do. But, I, but do whatever you can to get out in a place where you're not serving debt. And serve Lord. I've run out of things to say. Let's pray. Father, we are, we are so easily captivated by money and possessions and stuff. We pray, Father, that today we would see our stuff as your stuff and that we would be grateful for every gift you just unbelievably bestowed upon us. Thank you, Father, for, for loving us. Thank you for the treasure in heaven that we can know and have as we seek to love you and love people like Jesus. Give us a hunger. Give us a, a craving and a heart to love you that way, to serve you that way, as opposed to stuff, because we know ultimately that's where fulfillment is found. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.